Welcome to the Omnibus Show, a program for people who are interested in everything, with deep conversations on a wide variety of subjects. And now your host, Dave Gibbs. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Omnibus Show, the program for people who are interested in everything, with deep conversations on a wide variety of subjects. Today's guest is Jeff McDermott who has served since September 2016 as president and CEO of the nonprofit Center for the Performing Arts in Carmel and the affiliated Great American Songbook Foundation, both headquartered at the landmark Palladium Concert Hall. Previously, he worked 31 years as a partner and practicing attorney with Craig DeVault, where he was a four-term member of the executive committee chair of its litigation practice, and the executive partner of its Carmel office. That's a lot to say. Well, Jeff, welcome. Thanks. It's great, great to have you here great today. Great to be here. Well, this is um, quite a career you've had. It's just, it's, it's amazing. Um, I have so many questions for you, but let's start off at the beginning. Um, your pathway, what led you here? What, what was uh, your deepest desire drive when you were starting out? Uh, I would say it's very non-traditional. Mm-hmm. Um, in high school, junior high, high school, I played baseball. And my plan, like so many kids my age back then, was to just be a baseball player or a professional athlete. That, that was the goal. And uh, so I I, that was my focus. Uh, went off to college uh, and was fortunate enough to play baseball. My freshman year, I uh, went to SMU down in Dallas, Texas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, played baseball down there and had a had a great experience down there uh, until the end of that freshman year when the university uh, canceled our baseball program oh, along my. with a number of other non-revenue sport programs down uh-huh. there. It was 1980 middle of a recession, uh, private school, having some economic challenges. And uh, so we were allowed to transfer out uh, and go to a different school. We didn't have to redshirt. I transferred to Purdue. My older brother was at Purdue. I was a Purdue fan. That was a school that I had looked at previously anyway. Uh, Played baseball there. Um, My sophomore year when I got to Purdue, they told me I needed to declare a major. I had gotten an A in a political science course at SMU, so I said, well, obviously I'm a political science major. Baseball wasn't a major, uh, at least not one you could claim. Exactly. Uh, You know, and I was there to play baseball. Sure. Uh, So um, pursued political science while I was there, and by my junior year, you know, was taking a look around, and baseball was not going to be a career for me, clearly. Um, I was a pitcher, and in high school, I had a pretty good fastball. In college, it was an average fastball for college, and it wasn't going to get any faster. So um, got a little more serious about what I was going to do next. Um, I remember talking to my dad, uh, mm. who uh, changed careers when he was in his early 40s, and I remember saying, wow. I'm going to be a baseball player, but now I'm not, and I don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up. And I remember my dad saying he didn't know what he wanted to do for a living until he was 40 and finally found the profession that he loved. I became a real estate broker, and he and my mom uh, worked together. We're actually one of the very first uh, husband-wife real estate teams in Indiana and used to teach seminars on how to be a husband-wife real estate team. That's great, having a husband and wife team. Yeah, and so I I learned, you know, that was, my dad convinced me, you know, it's okay to change your dream, and uh, I took the LSAT. I now had a political science degree that I was working toward and wasn't, sure what I would ever do with that, so I took the LSAT and, and uh, uh, used that, was able to go to Notre Dame for law school, and, mm-hmm. um, and that's the direction that I ended up taking, and I uh, was fortunate to get an opportunity to work with Creek DeVault uh, here in uh, central Indiana and work there for 31 years. And you were a litigator, and you were an executive in, in, in that position. Um, that that's quite a career, thirty-one years. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, lawyers don't stay with one firm that long anymore. So that uh, you know, it was it was a, a great fit. Yeah. For me, and um, I got a lot of great opportunities there, and got to serve in management for a dozen years. And mm-hmm. um, we opened up the Carmel office uh, during my tenure there, and I, I got to head that and uh, head our litigation practice. And so, yeah, really had a lot of fun. Loved practicing law. Yeah, they're very well known here in Indiana, and I know you have a Chicago office as well. Chicago office, yeah. Or you did have a 
you, yeah, the, the team still has a Chicago office there. And, uh, but the transition, you, you became the president and CEO of the Center for the Performing Arts, which is kind of an artsy, yes. from law to arts. That's It's an unconventional <clears throat> path. Um, that, that's, uh, that's some, some great gymnastics. I say there. nobody goes to law school to become an arts administrator, but that's uh, <laughs> how, it, how it turned out for me. But that's that. That is um, that's amazing. How um, how did that turn? So in you? 2010, our former mayor uh, Jim Brainerd mm -hmm. asked me to join the board of the Center for the Performing Arts, which hadn't even opened yet. The Palladium opened in January 2011. I had just rolled off of a couple of other boards. I was looking for something new and different to do. Yes. Um, in terms of uh, you know sort of civic or nonprofit volunteerism, um, and I remember saying to Mayor Brainerd, you know, I don't have an arts background, and he said, we're not looking for people with arts backgrounds. We're looking for people in the community who have some business background and who you know are, are who love Carmel, and um, so I, I agreed to do it, uh, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll never forget joining that board and going to my first board meeting, which I think there were maybe nine of us, and I could not have felt more out of my league because I was um, among some just giants in, in philanthropy and arts, um, but um, it, they took me in, and I, I learned a lot, and I thoroughly enjoyed the experience as a board member at the center. In fact, um, uh, became very involved uh, in a variety of capacities as a board member. Uh, we ended up um, uh, affiliating uh, formally with the Great American Songbook Foundation, which mm -hmm. Michael, Feinstein Michael Feinstein had brought to Carmel. Uh, I was involved in, in that negotiation and, and helping to uh, draft the affiliation agreement which called for seven members of the center's board to go on to the foundation's board. I was one of the people asked to do that, and I was asked to chair that board, which I did for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly found myself wearing many hats with both organizations. Yeah. And then um, you have that and the Palladium. You've got an, an amazing, and they've got all those shows. We'll, we'll talk about the shows in Chapter 2, but... Um, that is that's an that's an incredible transition, and uh, the Center for the Performing Arts has become its um, its own location. You know, I mean, every place has its location, but you know what I mean. It's a yeah. destination um, um, location, and I think that 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 has been uh, Carmel has become a destination city at, from being a suburb, and. The amazing thing about um, the center and the Palladium is that you get A-listers and a very broad group of A-listers uh, here, rather than having, in the old right. days, you have to go downtown, down to the circle, and so or go to Chicago, or, um, you know, if a show is in, um, you know, like Broadway, you have to go to New York, and so that, that was... Yeah, we're very proud. I mean, we're, you know, when, when I came, so to sort of finish my pathway um, in 2016 is when I actually transitioned from board member to president and CEO at, at first uh, as an, in it, on an interim basis. Yes. Um, so we had, um, I was actually involved in a pretty significant piece of litigation a, at that time and um, had been working crazy hours and getting ready for it. We were scheduled for two months of jury trial here mm -hmm. in Hamilton County. And um, the second day of jury selection, the judge brought in over 300 prospective jurors. The second day of jury selection, uh, the case settled at 2 in the morning. And um, we, we wrapped up the case the next day, dismissed the jury, and I headed up to my lake house um, uh, up in northeast Indiana to just decompress for sure. a little bit. Um, our then president and CEO emailed me and asked if I would come back and have breakfast with her and the, the chairman of our center's board. I was chairing the foundation's board at the time. Uh, I came back from the lake on Monday, and uh, she arrived at breakfast and, uh, without sitting down, let us know that she'd taken a new position up in Chicago. She was leaving and um, gave us 30 days' notice and said, I know you've got a lot to talk about, so I'm just going to let you two have breakfast. And uh, we proceeded to chat about what we needed to do. We needed to talk with our staff and talk with the board and talk, you know, have media uh, coordinated. And um, during that breakfast, our then CEO, our then chairman, board chair, said, "Would you want to 
be the interim president and CEO for a while. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, what in the world do I know about running a performing arts center? And he said, well, what do any of us know, but don't you have two months available on your calendar? Which I did because this case had settled. Uh, and so I, I joke, but not really, that my main qualification at that time was availability. Mm -hmm. But I think about how the stars needed to align you know, sure. for me to get that opportunity and then how they've aligned since. I mean, literally and figuratively, and to your question about you know, bringing A-listers here, we, we bring great commercial, uh, well-known, popular artists here, and we bring uh, world-class uh, artists who are not very well-known mm -hmm. uh, and everything in between. And we're really proud of uh, the variety, the diversity of programming, you know, whether it's pop rock, comedy, country, classical jazz, songbook, international family programming. I, I like to think that we have a wider variety of programming at our venue uh, at venues than any place you'll find in Indiana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is is diverse because you, you you have a, a number of of areas where people perform at the center and in the theaters around the, the the center around the Palladium. You have the Palladium with the concerts, which is a unique, just a unique um, um, theater, and and then you have the Songbook Foundation, which has mm -hmm. its own. Um, program right. We have gallery space in the Palladium for the Songbook Foundation. We have uh, plans to build a Hall of Fame experience museum, uh, whatever you want to call it, directly north of the Palladium. Uh, yeah. That we've uh, the city has acquired land for that, and we're uh, going to have a, a long-term lease agreement, much like we do with the Palladium and the Tarkington Theater and the Studio Theater. So we're really excited about the growth and the changes to come. Well, that's fascinating. Um, what I'd like to do is come back for chapter two and ask you about your philosophies uh, of how you manage this type of entertainment as unique and and some stories that you would have. There have been a few. That you can tell us. Okay. Um, what are good stories for us I'll to talk to about. It. And, um, but I'm, interested in learning about your management style and also the experience that we could learn from about how to run um, such a, a center in a, a theater, performing arts um, center, um, which is just, that's quite a project. That's quite a project to do. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's a, lot it's a fun. project, a lot of moving pieces, you, you but it's also have a lot that of fun. fun. It's got to be fun if you're in the game, yep. isn't it? Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Well, we'll be back after a short break for Chapter 2 of The Omnibus Show. Hello. And welcome back to Chapter 2 of The Omnibus Show. Today's guest is Jeff McDermott, who is the President and CEO of the Center for the Performing Arts here in Carmel, Indiana. And you were telling us about your unique story in Chapter 1, which was, I don't know any lawyer who's ever gone from baseball to, to law to, to art. That's quite a career. Can you tell us about how you manage, what's your philosophies? How do you manage such a, a, a it's, it's dynamic, isn't it? Because you have all these artists coming and going, and it's not like having a, a retail shop where it's people coming in and out buying products, but it's like actual events. Yeah, it's definitely not a rinse and repeat <laughs> business. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's something different every day. Um, I, I think a lot of the management that I, I never had a management class in college. Uh, so it's def definitely been, you know, learning. MBA um, on the job. MBA on the job is a very good way of putting it. And yeah. so I've, I've gathered a lot. I've mimicked a lot of what I've seen from others uh, that has worked. And, and I've kind of then developed my own style. But I think, um, you know, I've learned that managing in a law firm, there's a lot of similarities to managing any organization. Uh, but the arts are different in a lot of ways as well. You know, so we've got different artists coming in. Every day is a different show. Um, we have different departments who work different hours. You know, our production team works really odd hours. Sure. Our, our box office works very different hours sometimes. Um, you know, finance and others work more nine-to-five type hours. Um, but, I, you know, I've, 
developed certain sort of philosophies, I would, I would call it. Uh, you know, I, I think maintaining a good sense of humor and letting people know that you've got a sense of humor and you can be self-deprecating and you can break tension when it needs to be broken, I think oh, yeah. is important. That is. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I always think criticize or critique privately, praise publicly, let people know when they do a good job. Um, I think appreciation is the least expensive currency and maybe the most valuable currency you can ever spend. Let people know when they're doing well. Um, let them know you appreciate the work they're doing. So I think things like that. You know, one thing I, I've always felt like, I never sit at the head of a table. That's just something I've always felt strongly about. I, I'm the president and CEO. I don't need to sit at the head of the table to prove that to myself or anybody else. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I find that if I sit at the head of the table, I'm, my body language is telling people, you know, I'm going to make this decision and it really doesn't matter what, what you think. If I sit around the table, then I get more of a collaborative feel uh, to a meeting. I get people to speak up. Um, I'm, I'm part of the group making the decision. I see. And, and I recognize that at the end yeah. of the day, the decision, if it's a close call, still needs to be mine, but I'd rather make it by committee when we can. And sure. when we can't, you know, the buck has to stop with me. So Yeah. Um, you've mentioned me before the show. You did your own version of the Undercover I Boss did. show. Can you tell us about that and how, how that helped your management style and how that um, helps run the, the center? Sure. So I came into this knowing different things about management. I understood budgets and I understood marketing and I understood personnel, HR issues from my legal background. I didn't know the first thing about production. I didn't know the first thing about programming of shows. I didn't know the first thing about... Frankly, what our volunteers, we've got a 300-person volunteer crew that serve as ushers and docents and other things. So yeah. my, my part of my philosophy is to be a good leader, you have to understand what people do. They're the experts. I'm never going to know what they do as well as they know what they do it. You know? so, but I need to know enough to be able to support them. And um, I didn't know about certain of these areas. So I thought kind of fun for me and a good way to learn was to be a bit of an undercover boss. Um, my people always knew who I was, but that wasn't always true for, for others. So, a mustache uh, and an eye patch or something. <laughs> so we, we had, for instance, we had um, Leanne Rimes uh, came and performed at the Palladium. Country artist. Yeah, yeah, wonderful country artist. That day I decided I wanted to work the production team. So I came in in jeans and a black shirt, and my team knew who I was, obviously, and they taught me how to focus the spotlights and lay the cable and, and things like that. But when Leanne's... Give me a coffee. Yeah, <laughs> when Leanne's team got there, they did not know who I was. And I asked my team, don't let them know. I want to see how they interact with you. Okay. And so it was a great way to learn. I, I saw the two teams come together when the, when the semi backs up and the crates start coming off the truck. I saw my production team and her production team speaking the same language, working as a team, coordinating everything. Um, and it was... It was I, I was so impressed with what my team did, and I was so impressed with how well they interacted. And I, I, I joke, but not really. At the end of the, that load-in, I, I, I guarantee that Leanne Rimes' production team thought that production team here at the Center for the Performing Arts is one of the best we've ever worked with, except for that old guy over there <laughs> who clearly doesn't know what he was doing. That evening, I, it was fun. I, I went home, I, I changed clothes, I came back in a suit and tie, and I did the, uh, the, the welcome, and her production team sort of looked at me when I came in like, what is, why is he back and why is he all dressed up? But it, it was fun, a fun way to do it. I was an undercover usher one night. Uh, we had a, a show. I, I came in in the black pants and the white shirt and tie, and I read our usher manual cover to cover. They assigned a mentor to me, and I, I scan tickets. I help people to their seats. You know, I oh, learned okay. that you welcome people to their seats. You don't point at their seats. Um, but I also learned a lot about our usher experience. They're an mm -hmm. all-volunteer group. Um, uh, they, they tend to be more senior in age. Mm -hmm. uh, they are standing on hard marble for four hours. We, as a result of that, we, I, I learned things, and we were able to make some changes. We were able to bring in more seating, provide more opportunities for them to sit and watch the shows at opportune times, provided a, a, a sort of a, a benefit system. The more hours they work, they gain points so that they could come to shows at no charge. You know, nice. were, and, and, and I always made sure after that that every single night when I do a stage welcome, I always thank the ushers as well because they're donors. They're giving of their time. Their time. And, yeah. uh, and I think it helped me understand what they do, what our production team does, what other, others do, and it helped um, me know how I can best support them. And I think it also gave me some credibility with them that um, you know, I, I was 
truly interested, genuinely interested in what they do and, and how to make their experience even better with us. So, Well, that's, that's basic good management when you're, <clears throat> when you're working with people rather than kind of just, you know, coming down from above and everybody's like, hey, you, get over there yeah. type of thing where you're actually working with them. I think that I learned from my father about, you know, his view is he didn't do all the different jobs when he was in television, but he connected with people. Mm -hmm. But that takes it a step further when you actually step in and do the jobs with the people. Yeah. Well, you gain a much better appreciation <clears throat> yeah. of what their challenges are. And, um, you know, and even we, we've got people who work in the building, but they work in various areas of the building. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you have to get up out of your desk and chair and out of your office and, you know, I say make rounds, you know, make sure you're checking in on people and saying hi and staying in touch. You know, you can't be, you, you, you want undercover boss is kind of fun. You don't want to be an invisible boss. So, oh, of course, yeah. cause that, that either people can take advantage of you or people can get off their game. Exactly. You, you need a coach basically the boss is like the coach in, in, a, in a baseball sense where you, you know, to better their game. You know, you say that. It's interesting also. I, I go to pretty much every show, um, every mm -hmm. Center Presents show, 60 a year, and I do the stage welcomes and I greet people. And I will have people sometimes, uh, two things. I'll have people sometimes, they'll see me multiple nights in a row, and they'll say, I can't believe you're working every night. And I, my, my quick response is, it's hard to call what I do work. Um, when, when you're at a show and you're drinking a glass of wine and you're talking to people, yes. um, it, it's, a, it's a pretty great experience. But, um, you know, I, so I, I think of it that way. But I also Work is say, fun or fun is work. But people will say, well, why do you go to every show? And I say, well, the same reason the Colts coach goes to every game. <laughs> you know, it's game day. That's it's what we do. Day. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, that's, you know, you sit in a lot of <laughs> development meetings and budget meetings and mm -hmm. HR meetings. Um, but the shows are the fun part, and that's that's where you get to play the game. So yeah, that, and you win. <laughs> yes. So yeah, we we uh, we we we're pretty undefeated when it comes to showtime. So well, that's great. Um, Jeff, where's some to kind of go on? You've got you must have some really great stories to share with our audience on. Well, let's say stories you can tell, but it probably what, what are some uh, stories that you can share with our audience oh. about the experience? And um, before I ask that, I do want you have quite a sound. The sound in there is is pretty spectacular. Spectacular, yeah. and that's something that I, every time I go in there, it's just I I I don't think the only word I kind of think of is unique. Because it obviously the sound engineering was was well done. Yeah. Whoever engineered, I don't know who the engineer was, but they did a great job. Yeah, it's sensational. David Schwartz was the architect, mm -hmm. um, but there were acousticians and, and others involved. I, I think it's fair to say that the Palladium itself is probably one of the most acoustically perfect uh, venues in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the the interior is nothing but. Uh, you know, plaster instead of drywall and, and things like that. Um, that makes a difference. It definitely Son makes a difference. Sonically. Um, you know, just the, the way it was designed, uh, we, we have a uh, an acoustic canopy of, of glass, uh, maybe the only one like it in the world with, um, you know, tons and tons of glass held above the stage that can be moved and positioned in any place. And when we do a sound check, we can change how the... the, the the hall is itself an instrument, and so we, we yeah. will literally tune the hall for a show. We'll determine whether we need to carpet the stage or have the hardwoods. We'll have uh, whether we need curtains drawn or, or open, where we need to position the glass canopy to get the most perfect sound. Uh, so we, yeah. we, we take a lot of pride in that. Yeah. Yeah, you do. And it's always, when I've, when I've been there, always an excellent production. And uh, But on to the stories now. What, what are some... Um, really uh, wonderful stories that you can tell us about being there at the yeah. center. You, some, some that come to mind. Um, first of all, I will say that the artists who come, um, by and large, are leading lives as traveling artists that are not nearly as glamorous as people might think. And so one of our goals is to always make sure that they are 
they feel very welcomed and they're well taken care of. Mm -hmm. You know, they're on buses, they're on tour buses, they're often leaving a show, traveling through the night to the next location. So we feed them very well. Oh, good. Um, we take great care of them. We have artist concierge uh, people who, from the minute they step off the bus to the minute they get on and leave, you know, make sure that they have everything that they need to be comfortable and, and well taken care of. And and um, the artists almost always remark about that. Um, they remark about two things from the stage almost without fail. They remark about how beautiful and the hall is and how well they sound in it and how great they have been treated uh, by our staff. That's great. People, in fact, ask me, do you put in their contracts that they have to say nice things about your staff in the hall? I said, no, they just always do that. The only thing we tell them is how to pronounce caramel correctly um, because if they pronounce caramel. it caramel or caramel, caramel uh, they, the, the audience will, will correct them. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, so they're, they're pretty good about that. But, you know, I've got some favorite stories. Um, John Cleese. Uh, the British uh, humorist from Monty Python days uh, came, did a wonderful show, was just wonderful backstage. And I do a stage welcome before uh, every performance, so I was backstage getting ready to go out, and John uh, was backstage just sort of talking up everybody and very loose and comfortable with everybody. And he said to me in his very British accent, which I'll, I'll brutalize here, but he said, now, okay. now Jeff. He said, you know, when you go out there, I want you to remember one thing. And I said, well, what's that, John? He said, don't trip. And I said, well, John, why would you say that to me? And he said, because I think it would be absolutely hilarious if you went out there and tripped after I just said that. <laughs> so when he goes, and another thing, for God's sake, don't go out there and say I'm some sort of comedic legend. I hate that sort of rubbish. And I said, okay. And I, the doors open, and I went out to do my, my stage welcome. And as I walked out, I thought, don't trip, don't trip, don't trip. And I didn't trip. And I got out there, and I thanked our, our patrons for being there. And I thanked our donors, and I thanked our corporate partners. And I said, you know, and now we're very excited to have John Cleese here. You know, he's just a legendary comedian. And I didn't even think about why I, it just came out, maybe because he put it in my brain. And literally, as I said that, all of a sudden, I heard him yell, I told you not to say that. And I looked, and he had come out the doors and was halfway out the stage yeah. yelling at me. And I remember looking at him, and then I turned back to the audience, and I said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, he did tell me not to say that. And I said, I apologize. Um, John Cleese is here tonight. He's old, and he's not that funny anymore. John, come on out. <laughs> um, but he was just a dream, a really fun, funny guy that's to work hilarious. with. So. Well, that's fun. Uh, especially you got to be part of the, the comic. Group, yeah, so. um, unbeknownst to me, it just turned out that way. So, yeah, other, other great stories. Um, uh, oh, Dennis DeYoung was one of my favorites. The lead singer of Styx wrote Sticks. most of their music. Yeah. Um, and and I, I, I always make it a point not to gush. Um, you know, in my job, my job is to welcome an artist. Um, our artist concierge would often call me and I would come down mid-afternoon when they're settled in or maybe they're just finishing up a sound check or a rehearsal and I could welcome them and thank them for being there. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I saw Dennis DeYoung perform with Styx in 1980 when, when I was at SMU. When they were... And, and under, when Styx was at, were the, at their height, yeah, right? Their height. And I came down mm -hmm. and they were just finishing up their rehearsal and he was out there and I was stage left just watching and listening and he was, I remember he played Renegade and Babe and he was 70 years old, hitting every note, wow. and sounded as good as he did when he was 40. And it was just fabulous, and I, it was very nostalgic for me. And when he came off stage, our artist concierge said, you know, Dennis, I, I want you to meet Jeff McDermott. He's our president and CEO. And I said, Dennis, really great to have you here. Carmel welcomes you. Thrilled to have you here, and I, I hope we're being treated well. And then I gushed, and I didn't mean to, but I, I, I gushed a little bit, and I said, I, I have to tell you, I was just listening to you perform those last two songs, and it was, I mean, it, it was nostalgic for me. I said, you sounded great. I saw you in 1980 perform, and you just sounded wonderful. And all of a sudden, I realized I'm gushing, which I'm not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And he said, thanks very much. He said, so you're the president and CEO here. And I said, yeah, I, I am. And he said, uh, are you coming to the show tonight? And I said, well, yeah, of course I'll be at the show tonight. And he said, well, I imagine you'll be around a lot of important people tonight. And I said, well, yeah, we'll have donors and, and other <clears> people. He goes, let me give you some advice. Um, try not to weep too openly <laughs> when I perform. And That's so great. Is he, you know, he kind of, in his very funny way, kind of let me know, hey, don't gush. But he was yeah. just wonderful. But then, I, then he also said, he goes, I got to tell you, Jeff, this hall, and he kind of looked up, and I'm sort of beaming with pride. And he looks up, he goes, 
what a dump. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, a, it's continuing. I literally, I, yeah, he could have like gone to, down Cleese to Cracker's thing. Comedy Club after yeah, the yeah, show. Exactly. He's a very funny guy, very engaging. And, and I laughed. He goes, did you think that was funny? It's like break that, a leg. I, I, I said, Dennis, that was pretty funny. He goes, I might use that tonight. And sure enough, he came out. He, he sang the first two songs. said, ladies and gentlemen, it was great to be here. And he kind of looked up. And I was like, here it comes. He goes, what a dump. And the whole crowd <laughs> cracked up. So he that, tried out his material on me first. So That, 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 is, that is hilarious. Um, Gosh, I could go all day. We could just listen to all these yeah, stories. There's, there's been a bunch. I've been very <clears> fortunate <throat> to have a lot of uh, unique uh, seats uh, to mm -hmm. meet a lot of interesting people and see a lot of things and hear a lot of stories from uh, a lot of pinch me moments in my job. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I've, I've gone on dates. I've brought family. But probably the most meaningful time when I've gone there is in 2016, Sophia Loren mm -hmm. was coming through town, and I got tickets to take my mother, um, because back in the was it the late 50s, before I was around, she had um, she and father were down at McGee's, which is a sandwich shop that's still there, in um, L.A. Farmers Market mm -hmm. on Fairfax downtown, and. Um, Cary Grant and Sophia Loren were right next to them, the table right next to them, and they were um, having sandwiches, they were having lunch, and um, I remember growing up every now and then my mom would always say, oh, she looks so beautiful and all this, but it, it was a trip that my, my mom had bad experience out there. You think back then, um, that period of time would have been idyllic, but <clears throat> it was a it wasn't dad. It was just stuff happened. It wasn't her right. favorite trip. So took mother, and when Sophia said, because it was a question and answer, she wasn't singing, but um, she said she preferred being a um, a mother and a grandmother over all that mm -hmm. you know diva actress that she was. That just won my my. She just went yeah. way up on on mom's um, uh, list. Um, after that, she just really loved that. I didn't get the VIP tickets, so if you want to meet these people, get VIP in advance. Uh, those um, help. Yeah. yeah, they do help. So, um, one of your colleagues had said, you know, you can write her, and I thought I've got to connect with her for mom. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote her, and I, I got on Google and I learned how to write it in Italian. I studied French as a student, so I wrote her to her home in Geneva in Italian. And I thanked her and I told her my mom's story because it was really the one highlight of that trip. And she'd always talked about it over the years, so that's why I wanted to take her there. And so she wrote me back in, Ital in Italian. In Italian, that's right. And it was very endearing, and I showed that to my mother, and that just really brought it back home. So when you have these events, they, they kind of are bigger than, uh, than just going to a show. Yeah, well, and it doesn't surprise me. And she, so many of our artists and, and personalities who come in. I mean, they're exactly that way. They're not, they're not divas. They, they are, uh, they're just wonderful people. They're appreciative of everything you do. Um, if, if we've got time, one other quick story. Please do. Uh, yeah, so again, obviously I grew up a baseball fan, and in the 70s, the big red machine, uh, on any day of the week, I could, have, I could have told you how many hits Pete Rose had, how many bases Joe Morgan had stolen, how many home runs George Great Foster players. had. Well, when I uh, just started uh, in my position as the interim president and CEO, we had an opportunity to bring in Pete Rose uh, to do a sort of a talk back, uh, an interview on stage with some highlights from his career. Mm -hmm. And um, so we did that. We booked it. And I, I got an email from a person who uh, emailed me and she said, well, you've now reached a new low. You know, you're supposed to bring artists in. Pete Rose is not an artist. Um, and he uh, was banned from baseball for gambling, you know, and he's addicted to gambling. How could you have him here? And so I wrote her back. I, I have a philosophy. If somebody writes to me with a concern or compliment, you know, I always write them back personally. Wow. And so, so I wrote her back, and I thanked her for taking the time to write and expressing her concern. And I said, you know, with due respect, I disagree with some of what you said. I said the spoken word in my mind is an art form itself, and he is here to speak to our audience. And um, you know, and bringing in someone like that can fill the hall, and that can help pay for some shows that maybe won't have as big an audience, but they're important mission shows to have. Mm. But I also said, um, you know, no question, he gambled, 
and he uh, was banned from baseball, and he's paying his debt for 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 that misgiving. Uh, but I also said, and he is addicted to gambling, and he's admitted that. And and with all due respect, if we ban people with addictions from coming here, there'd be a lot of people who might not be able to to come here. Um, I never heard back from her, but the the story goes on. Pete came. I came down to welcome him uh, and, and thanked him for being there. And he asked me if I'd like to have dinner with him backstage. And uh, he didn't ask for, you know, beef tips or sea bass or anything. He wanted a cold cut tray. So I had mm -hmm. a ham sandwich with my boyhood hero talking baseball backstage, which was a thrill for me. A friend of mine uh, had contacted me ahead of time, and he was a home care worker, people with different uh, illnesses or disabilities. And he had a gentleman with Lou, Lou Gehrig's disease, mm. and he was bringing him to the show. And he said, when I bring him to the show, he's a lifetime fan of, of, uh, of Pete Rose. He's in a wheelchair. So we made sure that we had a great spot up front Very for nice. a wheelchair, my friend. And I also said... I'm going to get you into the VIP meet and greet with Pete Rose before the show. Mm -hmm. While I was having my ham sandwich with Pete, I, I told him this story, and I said, this gentleman's coming. He's a friend of mine. He's bringing this person with Lou, uh, with Lou Gehrig's disease. And Pete said, don't just bring him to the VIP. Put him in the front of the line. I'll spend as much time with him as you want me to. That's great. So we did that, and um, I got to be with him as he was up there, and Pete was signing things and talking with him and signed his hat and signed his jersey and everything else. And just as they were getting ready to finish up, this gentleman in a wheelchair had a box on his lap. And Pete said, what's in the box? And the, the gentleman said, well, I brought you a gift. Take it off my lap, because this gentleman was, was, was not mobile. And Pete took the box off of his lap and opened it up, and it was a Bible. And the guy said, open up the first page. And my friend who brought this gentleman had written in there at, the, at, his, uh, at his patient's request to Pete Rose, my boyhood hero. And he put the number of hits that Pete Rose had in his career, which was well over 4,000, which is still today the baseball, baseball's uh, yeah. record for most hits. And Pete was clearly, clearly choked up. And everybody watching this was clearly choked up. And Pete said, this is great. This may be the most the greatest gift anybody's ever given me, there's one problem. He said, you didn't sign this. You didn't autograph this. I've autographed all this stuff for you. You didn't autograph this for me. And this gentleman said, well, Pete, I, I, I can't. And Pete said, nonsense. Don't ever say you can't do something. I'll help you. And with that, he put a pen in this gentleman's hand, took his hand, and helped him write his name. Wow. And, and I'm sitting there thinking, and that's, that's why we had Pete Rose. Yeah. You know, and that was a moment, like many moments, that – I get to witness that, you know, just make it such a magical place. That is. that That's a great story. That's um, incredible. Yeah. It really, really is. Yeah, it and was. When it, you have that, it just takes that experience to another yeah. level. Because it touches people's lives, and, you know, you you remember it the rest of your yeah, lives. Yeah, I'll never forget that moment. <clears throat> so it's more than just, just going to a show. And then leaving, and then like maybe I'll remember it or not. Yeah. It's just like that kind of human connection. Well, I often say, you know, I'll sit in a show and I'll watch the show, and they're always great shows. Um, but what what always strikes me is, you know, we, we may be a divided country in a variety of ways, and, and people may come in with different <clears throat> economic circumstances, different political views, or whatever it may be. But for those couple of hours sitting in those seats watching that artist, they're all there for the same reason, and they're mm -hmm. they're together and they're united, and uh, you know, and we get to make that happen, and that's a that's a privilege. That is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. That is really wonderful. And Jeff, thank you for sharing these stories with us today and your amazing story of 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 uh, being able to get from baseball to law to art i've been blessed there's that, no question about it that you have well thank you for being with appreciate us appreciate it today. great being with you well thank you well that's it for today's episode today's guest was jeff mcdermott who's the president and ceo of the center for performing arts here in carmel indiana We'd like to thank our sponsor, Hotel Carmichael. Today we're shooting in Feinstein's, and we look forward to being with you on our next episode of The Omnibus Show. If you enjoyed this program, please like, share, and subscribe to continue the conversation. For The Omnibus Show newsletter, please sign up at theomnibusshow.com.